So, Wally, I have to say thank you uh, for some of your words of your hope for this year of being more in God's Word and to understand it more and to have it be the bread, like Jesus said. Man does not live on bread alone, but every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. We have a new year coming, and we've asked uh, this past year, we asked every time, you know, what has the Lord been saying to you? What have you been talking to Him? How have you been serving? Uh, have you been able to share Jesus? Have you been able to give generously? I just want to, in the midst of it, one of the most powerful things that is, can happen is that a body of believers reads the Word of God together. I'm just saying, when, when we all read the Word of God together, it will transform the body because we're we're learning from the same page the spirit is working in all of us and i want to encourage us to to learn more about jesus um, who is the author and perfecter of our faith and i want to encourage you to for us to maybe to make a commitment to read through you all have maybe all of you have different reading schedules i know i do but to to purposely read about jesus and jesus we find the most about jesus in the gospels uh, the good news part of the new testament in the books of matthew mark luke and john and they give us an account of jesus now there are four different witness accounts Two of them walked with Jesus. This is, now we're playing confirmation here. Does anybody know, anybody know who are the two that walked with Jesus that wrote about Jesus in the Gospels? The Gospels. We got Matthew and John. John. Yep. So those two guys walked with Jesus. The other two walked with guys who walked with Jesus. And now, can anybody guess what those other two are? Mark and Luke, yeah. So, Mark and Luke. Mark probably walked with Peter. Luke walked with Paul, who uh, walked a lot with the other guys as well. And so, these four guys give an account of Jesus, and they have... They want to give you the most accurate account of who Jesus is and what He has done. And, and so... What is amazing is that these four Gospels are not duplicates. They come from different aspects. You may say it's like a diamond, and you have different facets of the diamond, and you see a little bit different of who Jesus is. And so when you read through the Gospels, I'm going to say, if we were to say that, and we were to say we're going to read through Matthew, then we'll read through Mark, and then we'll go through Luke, and then we'll go through John. And if we do that before the end of the year, let's start back at Matthew, and then go through Mark, and then go through Luke, and then go through John. It will be amazing of what we learn about Jesus. First thing you'll learn about first is you'll say, I already did that. I already know that. And I just want to say, you, when you think you know it all, that's when you stop learning. You ever notice that? When somebody says, I know that, they quit learning. And so we all have to get through that stage. So when you go back to it, you go, oh, I already read that. I already know that. Just a hint. You've turned it off your heart. You've turned off your ear. You've turned off everything. And then by, I want to tell you this, when you go through it the third time, you will start to say, when did that get in there? All of a sudden you start seeing and hearing things differently. I just, it is almost universal. And so I want to encourage us to, to practice going through. If we can make it through the Gospels three times. Liza. Okay, we're, it's already the third, so we got to catch up fast. But yes, it was, it's, it's not impossible. All right? So, I just want to tell you, just to give you a little hint there, if you have your Bibles, or even if you have the Pew Bible, you can write this in. Okay? So, all four of these are showing you Jesus, and not one of them contains everything. But when you read through that, I just want you to hint that each one is showing Jesus in like a different facet of a diamond. In the book of Matthew, Matthew's point is he wants to show you that Jesus is king and has authority and power to rule. Okay, throughout Matthew it is about, he is the king. The king. And Matthew was written particularly to Jews. Okay, we can read it, doesn't mean you can't. But his, his goal was Jews, and you'll find a lot of Old Testament quotes in Matthew. When you read Mark, 
you'll see that Jesus is a man of action. Almost the, the three years of ministry took place in two weeks, it looks like. He just keeps going, 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 going. He is a man of action. He does not stop. He just keeps on going. Mark was written mainly to the Romans, uh, probably to Roman soldiers. They just were people who were of action, and they found identity with Jesus as a man of action. In Luke, Jesus is a human being. He's the one we have the, the birth stories from. We have just how it lines out. We have more stories about his family and about uh, human interest. He just wants you to know that Jesus is a real human being. Okay? He didn't, we didn't make him up. He's fully human, but yet he is God. And he wrote mainly to Gentiles. You have to understand the culture at that time. There was a lot of Greek and Roman theology going out there. Demigods and other gods that were doing what kinds of whatnot. And, and they were having, Apollo was having, was having sex with this person, or Zeus was having, and they had all these demigods and all this stuff was going crazy. And, and Luke is writing in this place, you just got to know this, that he was saying when Jesus is fully human, he's fully God, he did not have sex with another person and came up with a new being. This was God who came and became like us. He let go of what was his and became fully human. And so that's very powerful as we read Luke. And in John, his point is that Jesus is God's son. He is God's son. From the very beginning, he's pointing that out. He is fully God, yet human. Isn't it kind of interesting how Luke and John work back and forth? And John's goal is to, is to write to all people. With his purpose is that you would believe that Jesus is the Christ, and in believing in him, you will have life. John's Gospel is all about you believing that Jesus is God's Son, and believing in Him, you would have life. So if you have your Bibles and you want, just write that on the very top of that, in Matthew, these things, so you just kind of understand where they're coming from and how, what a gift it is to us. So, we're going to be looking in Matthew. Matthew is Jesus is King. And so, to have you turn to Matthew chapter 2, very common story we hear, probably mainly at Christmas. This is an event that takes place actually after Christmas. It is quite often used in the time of, called Epiphany. Epiphany is that, that season in which celebrates Jesus being revealed to the world. Okay, and so this beginning. Epiphany actually isn't until the 5th. We've got to wait a couple more days, but we're jumping, we're a couple days early. So, Matthew chapter 2. And again, Matthew's point is, Jesus is king. Follow with me, if you will. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men, or magi, from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose, and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet, And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For for from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. comes from the book of Micah. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the, the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. 
After listening to the king, they went on their way, and behold, the star that they had seen when it went rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then, opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. All right. So we have there. So, what are some of your observations about this passage? What things did you notice? People, places, things. There was a special star. There was a star that was there. Yes. Jesus. Jesus. Yes, we have Jesus there. He's an infant. Star guided them. The star guided the wise men. They, the star guided them somewhere from the east. We're thinking maybe Babylon area, but guided them all the way over to Jerusalem. Yes, guided them, directed them. They gave them gifts. Yes. What? It probably took them about two years. It could be. We, that's what we think of. It's later on. Mm hmm. Do we hear that might have taken about two years? Anything else you notice? Well, the wise men weren't uh, Jewish. They weren't. They were uh, pagan, I guess, they're Gentile. They're Gentile. Yeah, they are not Jewish. But they knew the scriptures. They knew the scriptures, or they they knew where they had to go. Yes, they knew things. So that's why we kind of say Babylon, because there was quite a large settlement of Jewish people in Babylon because of the exile. Berean. I have not heard that. Hmm. What was their inquiry? Where is the king? Where is the boy born, king of the Jews? So you would, you would go to a place where kings are born. That would be to the king. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yep. What made them nervous and filled with anxiety? And they were asking, like they were inquiring. You know, like Herod inquired of them where the Christ was born. Like he didn't know, but here come the wise men who appear to know much more than those that are right. Yeah. Isn't it interesting? They ask, where is the king of the Jews to be born? Herod asks, where is the anointed one to be born? Two different things. And the wise men went to a house. So, I mean, they, weren't in, they still weren't in the manger scene. They were not there at the manger scene. No, our Christmas stories mess up our Christmas event. Yes. The wise men are probably, yeah, ways later. Yeah. Yes. So you're very surprised they did not sit in pews <laughs> as they worship the baby Jesus. <laughs> Is that, it would have been very interesting to see. It was. It gives a sense of a full out, full body spirit experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. 
Well, you've covered everything. Uh, not everything. There's way more. So, but we're going to go. Just want to go fast. So that's uh, our observations. So, what is Matthew's intent? Okay, so you've hit it all. Just there you go. Matthew's intent in sharing this story, Jesus is king. <laughs> the very first question is, where is the baby king born? Where is he? And they go to the King Herod. And in all, if you were to read through Matthew, if we were to read through Matthew 1 and chapter uh, all of 1, the book starts with about being a king and being the son of David. And to write into Jews, that means David's son, uh, King David. And so it's all about there. It's about his genealogy. It's a talking about that this king is being born. Right away from the get-go, somebody comes and says, Where is the king that is born? The king, the rightful king? At, well, at that time, who has Roman permission, King Herod, is perplexed. We'll know, he go, if we were to read the rest of chapter 2, we'll know that he goes ballistic. Um, and all of Jerusalem is in turmoil with it. Isn't it interesting, those who are not Jewish come to see the king. Those who are Jewish don't go see the king. Nobody from town goes to check it out. They send somebody else. I just want you to know that Matthew is going to show this, and it it's happens today. When it comes to Jesus, there is always the divided reaction to him. There are some that want to go see him, and want to go worship him, and want to be with him, and want to walk with Jesus. There are others who just get mad, and don't want that in their face, and don't want to be a part of it. And I ain't going to do that, because I'm just going to wreck my life, and so I'm not going to do it. That's Herod. What is the most destructive is indifference. You have a whole town of people, the city of Jerusalem, who are indifferent to it. They're curious, they're troubled, but they don't move. And I want to tell you, when we share Jesus, and when, you, when we speak about Jesus, you're going to have some that are going to want to follow him. You're going to have some others that are going to react negatively. And that's okay, because God's working on them. And that they're, they're just fighting it. So I'm just saying, God's on their way, and they're fighting it. But it's the crew in the middle that's indifferent that go, yeah, whatever. That is of the hardest heart. That's true with anything. I would rather have, isn't it what Jesus, isn't it what Jesus said to, uh, was it Laodicea? I wish you were hot or cold. I mean, be the extremes, but it means just, just be what you're there. But when you're lukewarm, what do I do? I spit you out. It's indifference. It's the hardest place. I just want you to know, when it comes to Jesus, people are going to react. People are going to react. In Matthew's intent, you said that, Kermit, Jesus is for the Gentiles. These are non-Jews. These are people who traveled quite a ways. These are people who um, are not followers of God at this point. They are outside. They are the least expected people to follow. And in the Old Testament, there was the idea that God only saves the Jews and the rest of the Gentiles, the rest of the world is going to be crushed. I um, have, <clears throat> through the hard way, learned God loves a lot of people a lot more than I do. Several years ago, when I became a follower of Jesus, I was in high school, or just graduated from high school, and there was a group of us, probably about eight, nine of us, that hung out together a lot. And in one of their, I kind of shared a little bit that what had happened to me and became a follower of Jesus, but there was one particular guy I did not because, well, John didn't really care and didn't want to be a part of it, and, and, and so I, John wasn't really interested in being a follower of Jesus, and I thought... He's not interested. So John went his way, I went my way. Several, several years ago, I was talking with his sister, who happened to marry somebody from our home church. 
And she started to talk to me how John became a follower of Jesus. He became a Christian. And how that happened and, and, and how his life had been transformed. And I got, <laughs> John wasn't interested in Jesus. And there he was. Last year I went to a funeral of a friend, a classmate of mine, Jim. Another friend that was a family friend, but we didn't do too much with. Again, Jim was not very excited about church. Um, the only reason he went to church is because his mom and dad forced him to go to confirmation. So, I went to Jim's funeral. He died as a, a young man in his 50s. And the testimony was that Jim was a follower of Jesus. And, and that, that friends had come to him, shared gospel, walked with him, and he became a follower of Jesus, became active in a, in a Baptist church, and was part of their leadership team. Jim? He didn't love Jesus, but Jesus loved Jim. And then as I was talking to classmates, I heard from Alice, who is now a follower of Jesus in Alexandria and a part of a church in there, and a, what God is doing in her life. Then I heard from Chris, who became a follower of Jesus. And I just want you to say that all these people, all these Gentiles, I had no idea that they would never love Jesus because they didn't want any part of Jesus. Jesus loved them so much so that he worked on them so that they could be followers of Jesus. I thought they were too far gone. They didn't want anything to do with Jesus. My mistake. My mistake. My hardness. My lack of vision. God loves way more than I do. And he's just showing here, Jesus is for all non-Jews and Jews. He's for all people. Do you know anybody that you've discounted as not coming to follow Jesus? You go, ah, they don't want anything to do with this. Did you ever mention the name of Jesus? They cuss you up one side and down the other, and, and you go, oh, just wait till God gets a hold of them. <laughs> and those are probably the very ones that God's going to call in. He's going to call them to his side. Matthew just wants to show us those who feel or who we exclude are included through Jesus. And in that, they come to worship. What was their intent in finding the boy? We've come to worship. Their whole intent was to worship. What did they do to prepare themselves for worship? They brought gifts. They fell down. They traveled for a long time. Mm -hmm. A lot of resources. What did they say? God is in our heart. Yes. So they did quite a bit to get there to worship. Can, can we agree on that? Or is that a worth a while agreement? They did a lot to get ready for worship. Here's the second question, a hard one. How much did you do to get ready for worship? Walked across the street. Walked across the street, yeah. I'm not, I don't want to shame, don't want to bear. But it is amazing to, to listen to these guys. They traveled maybe up to a, a year or whatever, following this, trying to find the star. Maybe only a few months, it doesn't matter. But their whole purpose was to worship Jesus. And, and, and they prepared themselves. They packed for themselves. They traveled for themselves. They had a whole caravan of people. They brought gifts. They, brought, they took care of things. They experienced, when they were coming before him, they, they humbled themselves and, and fell down before him. What would it look like if we prepared ourselves for worship?
What would it look like if we thought by Friday we were already going, we're going to go to worship together with the body instead of waking up Sunday morning and going, well, what should we do today? I'm not saying worship can't happen, but how many of you go on vacation and so wake up in the morning and go, um, I think we should do a two-week vacation today. Ready? How many of you do it that way? How many of you plot and plan and figure out what you'd like to do or go or, and what things you'd like to see and bring along? Anybody do that? Isn't it kind of fun to get ready? I know some people enjoy getting ready more than they actually enjoy the vacation, so that's a... Your wife does, huh? <laughs> yeah. They're just saying it's, it's, there's excitement about preparing ourselves and getting ready to go. What would that look like to prepare ourselves for worship? I'm going to say it does take time. And, and I, I can just put my own personal experience, okay? So, and I'll drag you, throw you under the bus. So, I, I usually write sermons, study them, and then write them on Saturday. And a couple of Saturdays, Corey's asked if I wanted to go pheasant hunting on Saturday morning because he's free. I love to. And so I go. It messes me up for Sunday. Oh, great. There. <laughs> His fault. <laughs> it messed me up because I have, my routine is about preparing. Saturday is all about preparing for Sunday. And, and, and I know when I do stuff on Saturday, anything I do on Saturday, it, it really it changes the mind, it changes things, and I just, I'm, it takes a bit to get going again. I need Saturday to prepare myself myself to be here with you. I can only speak my personal experience. What would it be like for us to prepare for worship? For that to worship with exceedingly great joy. What can we do? First thing I just want you to know this in all of what's then this whole event is about how much the Father loves you. Your Heavenly Father loves you very, very much. That's why He sent His Son. And I want you to know that Jesus loves you very, very much because He was willing to gave up everything to become like you and me to redeem us. Matthew wants us to see that you are loved very, very much. And the question for us is, how can I respond back to the one who loves us so much? How can we respond? Maybe the first response is that, that one that we take is that it is coming before Jesus and saying, I'm yours. That is the greatest act of love for Jesus, saying, I, I just give you myself. I think one of the things that we forget to do is to come back and to say, I'm still yours. For those of you who are married, or you have girlfriend, boyfriend, how many times have you told your spouse, I love you? And what, what's that comedian that says, and if it changes, I'll let you know. But how much we need to hear, I love you. We need to hear that every, every day. And I think it's important for us as we talk about how do we respond, is to, remind, to be reminded that to the Father and to Jesus, I'm still yours. I want to be yours. He does love you very much. 
and wants you to walk with him. Let's pray. Gracious God, I thank you for today. And Father, I thank you for your sending of Jesus, your son, who willingly gave up everything he had to be with us. We gained so much. Father, Jesus is king. He is the rightful king. And that always requires of us a response. And so, Father, I just thank you uh, that you are constantly drawing people to your Son. And today, if there's anybody that you've been calling, Father, that they may come and they, they may see Jesus and say, I, I want to be yours. I want to follow you. We can say that right where we are. Jesus, I want to follow you. It is also for us who have followed for a long time. Maybe we've been on the journey and are weary. You come to us and say, you ask us, are you still, are you still in love with me? But I love you very much. And so, Father, for us who have been walking, today is again a day to say, I still love you, and I am still yours. I thank you that your love knows no bounds. And I thank you that you are constantly drawing people to your Son. Keep drawing us. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.